We'll go ahead and get started then. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Commandant of the U.S. Army War College, Major General William Rapp, and the Director of the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, Colonel Peter Crane, welcome to the Discussions in Military History Roundtable for March 2016. Before we begin, I'd like to explain the format of the event today. We'll start with about a 45-minute lecture from our main speaker. With his conclusion, the first of our panelists will have an opportunity to react to the talk and pose a question or comment to the speaker on the topic. When their discussion concludes, we will repeat with the second panelist. When both panelists have, have the, had the opportunity to discuss their points, we'll move around the room with a microphone to accept questions from the audience. As I told you before, please remember we are recording this event for, uh, to post online and also for DVD production. So please wait for the microphone to come to you uh, and speak into it in a loud, clear voice. I'm honored today to introduce our speakers. I'll start with our first panelist, Dr. Chris Keller of the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army, or I'm sorry, sorry, at the United States Army War College. Dr. Keller served as a professor of military history for five and a half years at the Army Command and General Staff College at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, and has taught, numerous civilian, taught at numerous civilian institutions, including Shippensburg University, Gettysburg College, Dickinson's College, and Washington and Lee University. From 2001 to 2002, he was a Fulbright, Fulbright professor of American history at the University of Jena in Germany along with many scholarly articles focused on the ethnic experience of the Civil War. He is author of Chancellor's, Chancellorville and the Germans, Nativism, Ethnicity, and Civil War Memory, and co-author of Damn Dutch, Pennsylvania Germans at Gettysburg. He is currently writing The Great Partnership, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and the Confederate Strategy in the East, and is co-author of the forthcoming A Military History of Pennsylvania. Our second panelist is Dr. Paul Jussel. Dr. Jussel is a professor of military studies in the Department of Military Strategy, Planning, and Operations at the U.S. Army War College. Dr. Jussel is a retired Army colonel and focuses on theater strategy and campaigning. His passion has always been relating history to the current audiences for them to understand the value of past experiences in our modern world. And finally, our speaker for today is Dr. Richard Summers. Dr. Summers served over 43 years right here at the U.S. Army Military History Institute at the AHEC. Even after nominally retiring as the senior historian of the center in January 2014, he continues to teach at the U.S. Army War College, continues to write about the Civil War, and speaks to Civil War groups across the nation. He has published over 100 books, articles, chapters, entries, and reviews on the Civil War. His most recent book, the expanded revised 150th anniversary edition of Richmond Redeemed, The Siege at Petersburg, was published by Savas Beattie in September 2014. It was honored by the Army Historical Foundation with a Distinguished Writing Award as the best expanded reprint book in 2014 on Army history. In May 2015, he was designated a Distinguished Fellow at the U.S. Army War College. A graduate of Carleton University with a doctorate from Rice University, he was born and raised in suburban Chicagoland. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to introduce Dr. Richard Summers. Thank you, Carl. It's a great pleasure to be back home at AHEC. As you said, I've spent over 43 and a half years on the staff here. Uh, it's always a part of me. I feel always a, a part of it. So don't you believe the words that I'm retired? <laughs> and all the more a pleasure to, uh, to share in our roundtable discussion with two such eminent scholars and such good friends as my colleagues on the War College of Faculty, Chris Keller and, and Paul Jussel. Now this afternoon, I'd like to share with you some thoughts on Richmond Redeemed, opportunities won and lost in the siege of Petersburg. Now, some sieges are static, but not the siege of Petersburg. Unlike Yorktown, Fort Macon, Vicksburg, Port Hudson, Battery Wagner, and Spanish Fort, which really were fixed tactical sieges, often with saps and parallels and breaching batteries, sometimes even with mines, Petersburg towers as a strategic siege. 
It aimed to capture Petersburg and Richmond to be sure, but its strategic essence is that it eventually enabled federal forces under Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant to fix Southern forces under General Robert E. Lee in place in Virginia, while other Northern armies under Major Generals William T. Sherman, Philip H. Sheridan, and George H. Thomas devoured the rest of the Confederacy. Yankee operational approaches to fulfill this strategy focused on dominating the initiative strategically, operationally, and tactically. On maintaining unrelenting pressure on Lee's army and on punctuating the prolonged siege with major onslaughts, which I have termed offensives. And that term has now come into parlance in analyzing the, the siege of Petersburg. Those offensives launched from the security of Grant's great entrenched camp east and south of Petersburg targeted that city and Richmond and their supply lines, but rarely through direct assault. Mobile fluid field battles beyond the flanks of the siege lines were Grant's preferred means for waging the siege. Now, Richmond remained his target for obvious reasons. Seat of government, center of war industry, symbol of Confederate claims to independence. And Petersburg, too, was important in its own right. Second largest city in Virginia, seventh largest city in the Confederacy, site of the Confederate States lead works, which manufactured bullets. Yet the greatest military importance of the cockade city, as Petersburg was nicknamed, was logistical. It served as the rail center that connected Richmond with the rest of the Confederacy. From northeast, southeast, south, and west, four railroads ran into Petersburg. From there, a single railroad northward ran 22 miles to the capital. Foodstuffs from fertile south side Virginia, armaments from ports along the lower Atlantic coast, salt and lead from southwestern Virginia, and most vitally, reinforcements, all funneled through Petersburg to Richmond. Only one other railroad running southwest through Danville and the Carolina Piedmont linked the capital with the lower south. Defending Petersburg and its supply lines thus was crucial to defending Richmond. Capturing the cockade city could comparably cripple the capital. And here let me pause for a moment to say, don't strain your eyes trying to read the, the fine print uh, on these maps. They're, they're quite legible in the book itself. I'll highlight the, the major features with the pointer. Uh, on each map as we need to, to look at it. But you can just see the major cities, Richmond at the top of the map, Petersburg down here, Confederate fortifications are shown in red, Union fortifications are marked in blue. Now the, the Blue Coats nearly took Petersburg right at the start on June 15, 1864. They overran its outer defenses but were stopped short of the city itself. Then disaster befell Union arms in the second offensive, June 22nd to 29th. Thereafter, the mobile warfare of spring, which had carried the armies from central Virginia to James River, stagnated into the siege of summer as the siege of Petersburg began. The third offensive, July 24th to 30th, promised much, but accomplished nothing. M most successful to date was the fourth offensive, August 14th to 25th, which finally cut the Weldon Railroad, linking Petersburg to blockade runners' ports on the lower Atlantic coast.
by early autumn, three of the four railroads into the cockade city with the south had been severed. That is to say, the City Point Railroad, the Norfolk Railroad, and the Weldon Railroad. Only the South Side Railroad, from Lynchburg and Withville to the west, plus back roads through Dinwiddie County to a railhead on the still usable portions of the Weldon Railroad down here south of Petersburg, remained in secessionist hands. So with that context, let us explore Grant's fifth offensive of the siege, the subject of today's presentation and of my new book. There it is, my new book. the expanded 150th anniversary edition of Richmond Redeemed. Early autumn found the preponderance of both federal and Confederate forces south of the Appomattox River. 75,000 of Grant's 102,000 men and 37,000 out of Lee's 53,000. The entire Army of the Potomac plus the 10th Corps of the Army of the James occupied Grant's great entrenched camp east and south of Petersburg, from the lower Appomattox around to the clutch hold on the Weldon Railroad at Globe Tavern. Four Federal Cavalry Brigades covered the camp's rear, and 18 Confederate infantry brigades correspondingly garrisoned Petersburg's main fortifications. Five more brigades were constructing two new lines covering the last supply lines into Petersburg, and six Confederate cavalry brigades patrolled the open country south of those lines. And at this point, I might just ask, can people on this half of the room See the pointers that I put up on the map? If not, you're very welcome to consolidate the forces uh, closing up on your right flank if, if that would, uh, uh, would help. But if you can see fine, so much the better. North of the Appomattox, in Chesterfield County, 7,500 gray coats manned water batteries, protected the vital railroad linking Richmond and Petersburg, and corked some 16,000 Yankees in their bottle on the Bermuda 100 Peninsula. Another 6,900 Unionists guarded the crucial supply base at City Point, which is here and here and three points downriver at Harrison's Landing, Fort Powhatan, and Fort Pocahontas. Few forces served north of the James. Only 4,300 bluecoats at the Deep Bottom Bridgehead and the Dutch Gap Canal. And there, up here, Deep Bottom and Dutch Gap. Some 8,700 butternuts were there, but not quite half of them at the front. The remainder back near Richmond, including local defense forces and militia. Now, this distribution of troops, few north of James River, some in Chesterfield County, most south of the Appomattox, reflected not only the aftermath of the most recent Fourth Offensive, but also the probable prospects for further fighting. Grant, not Lee, decided when such fighting again erupted. The Illinoisan dominated the strategic, operational, and tactical initiative in the Eastern Theater for all 11 months from the wilderness all the way to Appomattox. Now too, he determined when and where to launch the Fifth Offensive. And making these decisions demonstrated his triple responsibilities as Army Group Commander, Theater Commander, and General in Chief of the entire Union Army. In the first capacity, he planned a major strike with most of his army group for October 5th to cut the remaining supply lines into Petersburg. At the same time, as general-in-chief, 
he intended to detach an amphibious force, six to 10,000 strong, from his army group to sail down the Atlantic coast and capture Cape Fear, North Carolina, blockade runners' principal access to the Confederacy. And yet it was Grant's third responsibility as Eastern Theater Commander that actually determined dates and targets for the Fifth Defensive. That theater had two major fighting fronts, not only the Tidewater, but also the Shenandoah Valley. In that latter region, Sheridan won two great victories at Third Winchester and Fisher's Hill on September 19th and 22nd. Grant, of course, applauded such achievements, but he was also concerned that they might cause the gray coats to abandon the valley and rejoin Lee to attack him, as Stonewall Jackson had done so effectively in June of 1862. The Illinoisan was also alert, lest Lee send troops to retrieve the deteriorating situation beyond the Blue Ridge. In fact, Lee did detach the Laurel Brigade of Virginia Cavalry there on September 27th. To forestall such detaching, to take advantage of any departures, and to preempt any Confederate attack, Grant moved up the timetable for his fifth offensive from October 5th to late September. He also postponed indefinitely the amphibious expedition against Cape Fear, and in place of the massive first strike on the south side, he substituted a two-pronged attack on both sides of James River. These changes demonstrate yet again the flexibility of methods within fixity of purpose, which were hallmarks of Grant's generalship. They also reveal his continuing confidence in success. He launched these operations not just because of events in the valley. By late September, he was convinced that the secessionists would abandon Petersburg if forced a little. Now he prepared to force. Including a strike north of James River, was the recommendation of Grant's senior subordinate, Major General Benjamin F. Butler, commanding the Army of the James. Despite his shortcomings as a battlefield commander, Butler proved a creative, original, strategic thinker. He undergirded his soaring conceptualizations with sound military intelligence gathered from deserters, prisoners of war, civilians, and the Van Lu spy ring in Richmond. Butler realized how few secessionists served north of the James. He proposed reconstituting his army as a mobile strike force, over 26,000 strong, that would launch a surprise attack to overwhelm these handful of defenders and then capture Richmond itself before Lee could rush reinforcements from Petersburg. Butler would launch this surprise attack from Bermuda 100, overrun these defenders, and sweep all the way to Richmond before Lee could bring up his forces from Petersburg. Grant approved Butler's proposed strike and set September 29th as the launch date. The Illinoisan also ordered Major General George G. Meade to assemble 25,000 men from his Army of the Potomac at and near Globe Tavern, ready to strike west against the Confederate supply lines. Initially, however, Meade was to await openings created by Butler. The Army of the James would deliver the first blow. So now, We'll move up to a map that will focus uh, on this uh, northern part of the sector north of James River. Now, this was a surprise attack strategically, but not in the tactical sense. The Confederates heard the Yankees crossing James River. But unfortunately, the Confederates suffered from divided command. 
there was no one officer responsible for all Confederate troops on the peninsula. General John Gregg, commanding the Texas Brigade, had charge of two brigades from the Army of Northern Virginia, plus a cavalry brigade that were guarding the Confederate position at New Market Heights, observing Deep Bottom. He was separate from Lieutenant General Richard S. Ewell, that's Ewell of Gettysburg, who was now commanding the Department of Richmond, and Ewell had his own troops over here. When intelligence came in that the Yankees were crossing, it looked as if they would again attack. Gregg understandably massed his forces on his left to protect Newmarket Heights, which had been the target of Union onslaughts in late July and again in mid-August. Ewell, who was trying to uh, reduce the Dutch Gap Canal, was afraid the Yankees were going to try to break up his new works <coughs> near the canal, and so he massed his forces on the far right near the Osborne Turnpike, and almost no Confederate troops covered the center. You see a lot of fortifications on this map, but they're almost totally unoccupied. Lee's basic strategy was dependent on having fortifications in place and the hope that he could rush troops to them before the Yankees could overrun them. But Butler, who realized how vulnerable these Southerners were on the peninsula, hoped that he could carry through with his surprise attack and capture the works, and the, the Confederate division of forces made the, the Federal effort all the easier. The Union right wing under General David Burney, and again we recognize him from Gettysburg, was going to come out of the Deep Bottom Peninsula and try to cut off New Market Heights. Burney, in theory, could have over 16,000 men. Meantime, the left wing under General Edward Ord was to throw a new pontoon bridge across James River from Bermuda 100 to Aiken's Landing, move up the Varina Road, and storm the Confederate entrenched camp on Chaffin's farm. And then the Cavalry Division, Army of the James, 2,200 men under August Couch, was to raid up here and get into Richmond itself. The objects were to cut off Newmarket Heights, capture the entrenched camps, cut the top pontoon bridges over James River, and for not just Couch, but the whole Union Army of the James, to seize Richmond. That was the plan. Unfortunately for the Yankees, Bernie moved a day late. Bernie himself did not know what his objective was when he set out from Petersburg. He thought he was going to be the amphibious force to attack Cape Fear. So he figured, well, I'll have, I can march my troops, they'll get on transports, we'll have a day or two to sail down the Atlantic coast, they can rest up. In point of fact, they didn't have any time to rest. They spent all night marching from Petersburg across the Bermuda 100 Peninsula up to Deep Bottom. The Corps straggled terribly. Over 2,000 men fell out of the ranks before they ever reached Deep Bottom, and they had no time to rest once they got there. Of the 16,000 men that he had, he sent in only about uh, 1,100 to make his attack, a black brigade. General Butler was a great advocate of using black troops in the Civil War, and he had targeted a black division, which was uh, stationed already uh, on the left bank of James River, to lead the assault. The first attack was bloodily repulsed attacked by another black brigade, was stopped in its tracks. But the, the U.S. colored troops stood their ground. Eventually, they moved forward and occupied the Confederate position at Newmarket Heights. The fighting here, and later in the day on September 29th, and the following day on September 30th, marked this Battle of Chaffin's Bluff as the biggest, bloodiest battle by black troops in the whole Civil War. You know, most of the battles we think about for the uh, U.S. colored troops, uh, they're really a very small 
amount of, of forces engaged. One battalion at Fort Pillow, one regiment at, at Battery Wagner, one brigade at, at, at Milliken's Bend. Here you have four brigades in only one other battle of the whole Civil War would as many as four black brigades be involved in combat. And there, their casualties were nowhere near the losses that the US colored troops would suffer in this battle. Some 1,456 men. 15 medals of honor would be awarded uh, to the US colored troops in this battle, one to an officer, 14 to enlisted men, and also there would be 27 medals given to white troops of the Army of the James and two to white soldiers in the Army of the Potomac. Now, why did the Confederates let up on their fire and yield New Market Heights to uh, the colored troops? It was because they realized that the most dire threat was not to the Heights, but to this surprise crossing of James River and the advance of the 18th Corps up the Verina Road to attack at Chaffin's Bluff. Overnight, federal engineers threw the pontoon bridges across James River. You know, James is a tidal river all the way up to Richmond. It was 1,367 feet wide, but the engineers bridged overnight. The two divisions of the 18th Corps crossed they charged the Confederate position and captured Fort Harrison. By 7 a.m., the fort was in Union hands. And here is Fort Harrison with the Union troops inside it. It was a tremendous opportunity. They could cut off the defenders of Newmarket Heights who were running west along the trench line, desperately trying to get back to the inner works. They could pour out inside the camp and take all these Confederate fortifications from the rear. And this line doesn't face south. This is the upper wall of the camp. It faces north. They could cut the pontoon bridges over James River, could reach Richmond itself. This was the greatest opportunity in the whole Civil War for the Confederate capital to be captured by a field army that could have held the city, not a handful of cavalry raiders, not a, a landing party from a naval vessel, but a field army, over 25,000 strong. And yet those opportunities went unrealized. Obviously, Richmond did not fall at the end of September 1864. Now, why? Part of it was General George Stannard's division, which captured Fort Harrison, was wrecked in the course of its victory. It suffered casualties of over 18%. All three of its brigade commanders uh, went down. Uh, General Hiram Burnham, one of those brigade commanders, was killed shortly after the fort was taken. He would be the only Union general officer killed in battle in the entire nine and a half months of the Siege of Petersburg. The Confederates would lose two generals right in this fifth offensive. The Yankees lost only one general in the whole siege, and it was Hiram Burnham. He had returned to duty only the previous day, and now he was dead. General Ord himself, commanding the left wing, would be severely wounded in attempting to uh, follow up the breakthrough. And he had to turn over command to his senior subordinate, General Charles Heckman, who had just returned from captivity, who had never before led even a division in battle, let alone a corps. Instead of bringing up his own second division inside the camp to exploit the victory, his troops bogged down in the swamps along Three Mile Creek and then made frontal attacks against the Confederate works. And the troops from Newmarket Heights got back here in time to defend those works and to beat off one Union attack after another. By the time Bernie finally came up from Newmarket Heights and attacked Fort Gilmer, he too was repulsed. And one major reason for this inability to exploit the success was the misallocation of force. Going back a map now, 
between Bernie's right wing, which had 16,000 men, and Ord's left wing, which had 8,000. Initially, both of them moved northward from Bermuda 100 to attack their first targets. But once they captured, or at least occupied those targets, their follow-up objectives were all up here to the northwest. So the left wing should have been stronger, but in point of fact, it was half the strength of the right wing. It took far longer for Bernie's troops to come up, and by the time they did, the Confederates were in place and beat off his attack, aided by the fact that the Yankees continued straggling all along the New Market Road. Uh, even a regimental commander was seized by the provost guard for, for straggling. And in recognizing Union shortcomings, we should also extol the incredible bravery of a handful of defenders. The skillful, inspiring leadership of John Gregg and Richard Ewell. Now again, here, with our proximity to Gettysburg, we tend to recognize or, or dwell on Ewell's shortcomings. But we need to recall that earlier in the Civil War, he had uh, done many good things at the first and second battles of Winchester, the first battle of Stevenson's Depot, the battle of Cedar Mountain. The greatest service Ewell ever rendered to the Confederate cause came on September 29th. 1864, where he threw together a makeshift line running through the middle of the entrenched camp that held the Yankees at bay until reinforcements could arrive. Initially, reinforcements from Richmond itself, then reinforcements from General Pickett's division in Chesterfield County, and by mid-afternoon, the vanguard of reinforcements from the Army of Northern Virginia that Lee was rushing forward a brigade at a time up the single track railroad that ran from Petersburg through Chesterfield County. And the Confederates were further aided by the fact that the James River Naval Squadron engaged in defending uh, the position. Three ironclads and five gunboats. The Union Navy could not get that high up uh, James River, so the uh, Confederate Navy had a free hand. Well, when night fell on September 29th, the Yankees had lost over 3,000 men. The Confederates had suffered many casualties, but they had lost only about 400 men. Now, there were maybe only about 18,000 Federals here at the front trying to refuse their left flank down the Verina Road, reversing the uh, Confederate exterior line which they had occupied. Southerners had brought in some 12,000 reinforcements, and another 5,600 were on the way. The Confederates had virtual parity with the Yankees as the fighting went in to the second day. Now, Butler initially intended to resume attacking, but he decided early Friday morning he would remain on the defensive. Lee himself had come over, so Dyer was the threat. But he didn't bring all these troops with him just to create defensive stability. Counterattacking was Lee's style of warfare, and he planned a massive counterattack for September 30th, some 8,800 graycoats going against the 2,200 northerners in Fort Harrison. The Confederate attack totally broke down, a complete lack of tactical cohesion, which demonstrated the decline of Confederate fighting power and, and officer, subordinate officer ability. The Yankees beat off the attacks and held Fort Harrison. Over the next two days, there was skirmishing and, and uh, back and forth, but the Confederates now contented themselves with sealing off the breach in the middle of the entrenched camp, and the Federals worked on fortifying their positions here on the peninsula. This battle of Chaffin's Bluff had cost the Federals nearly 3,400 men, the Confederates over 1,700. But while they were fighting here, another major battle was raging south of James River with the left wing of Grant's force. Butler had been the right wing north of the James. General Meade and the Army of the Potomac would be the second strike with the, with the left wing. And Meade is massing his strike force 24,000 strong at the western end 
of his camp. Now, on September 29th, Lee had sent over 15, or ordered over 15,000 of his men from Petersburg to Richmond. Some 9,400 actually went. He drew the troops from these outer lines back into the main defenses of the city and left only one or at most two cavalry brigades to hold those outer works. Lee was prepared to abandon Petersburg itself if necessary to save Richmond. So dire was the danger to the Confederate capital. And yet, one of the real hallmarks of Lee's generalship is that he did not equate probable disadvantage with certain defeat, but strove to redirect the military situation to his advantage by bluff if he could, by battle if he must. Lee did not fall back, Lee fought back. And indeed, he created such a show of force that Meade could see no openings on September 29th, and that night recommended to General Grant that the Army of the Potomac not go into action. But Grant would have the final decision. While he had great respect for General Meade, he realized that there must be some opportunities here with so many Confederates having left this area. So he directed Meade to advance on September 30th. And Meade would use about 24,000 men for his strike force. But note that he's leaving another 39,000 in his fortifications, uh, including 6,100 back here at the supply depot at, at City Point. So oh, here is the main field of the operations. Here's Globe Tavern. And the Union column advanced 20,000 infantry along this single road. It took them four hours to advance two miles in the face of minimal opposition. But it's understandable. General Gouverneur Warren of Little Round Top renown is leading, is leading the force. And he didn't know for sure how weak the Confederate position is, so he had to uh, take proper precautions. But finally, about 1 o'clock, he stormed the Confederate position on Peebles Farm and captured this line. Now the Yankees could have advanced up the Church Road to the Plank Road, out here and up the Harmon Road to the Plank Road, straight up the Squirrel Level Road to Petersburg itself. Instead. They took up a defensive position around Peebles Farm. Again, this is completely understandable. But every Union advance from the wilderness on May 5th to Globe Tavern on August 18th and Second Ream Station on August 25th had provoked a Confederate counterattack. The Yankees had a healthy fear of the danger lurking in the unknown country into which they were venturing for the first time. So having gained that immediate success at Peebles Farm, they now took up a defensive perimeter. And it would not be until about 3 o'clock that the Ninth Corps under General Park would advance up onto Oscar Pegram's farm and finally advance up onto Jones Farm about 5 o'clock. Meade had been way back at his army headquarters, had not been present during the initial fighting, did not reach the front at Peebles until mid-afternoon. Of the 20,000 Union infantry that moved out of Globe Tavern that morning, only about 1,200 were probing towards the vital supply line along the Boydton Plank Road. By the time they got there, the local Confederate commander, no longer General Beauregard, who had left Petersburg on September 23rd, but A.P. Hill, who was in charge at Petersburg now that Lee himself had gone to Chaffin's farm. General Hill had massed a powerful Confederate force of about 9,000 men. They launched a series of counterattacks which defeated four out of the five brigades of the Ninth Corps. And it was only in the gathering twilight uh, at the end of the day that the final Union line in Oscar Pegram's farmyard, bolstered by Charles Griffin's division of the Fifth Corps uh, astride the Church Road, finally stopped the last Confederate drive 
uh, of the day. And so fighting ended. Uh, the Yankees had lost some 2,200 men on September 30th, including 1,300 prisoners of war. Three uh, whole federal regiments were captured in mass by Wade Hampton uh, out here as they were seeking to escape uh, from the Confederate counterattack. The Southerners had lost about 600 men. Now, Meade initially thought he would remain on the defensive, but again, under Grant's prompting, Meade embraced the idea of resuming the advance on October 1st. However, his two corps commanders at the front, Warren of the Fifth Corps, Park of the Ninth Corps, were determined to remain on the defensive. A.P. Hill, on the other hand, was determined to resume his attack that had accomplished so much on Friday afternoon. General Cadmus Wilcox, who had spearheaded the advance that day, was to move his forces uh, forward onto Oscar Pegram's farm against the Union front, while Henry Heath, again, someone we remember from Gettysburg, was to bring his whole division down the Squirrel Level Road and get into the right rear of the Union forces, just as the Confederates had done on August 19th at Globe Tavern. On October 1st, however, the Yankees had refused their right flank, so it now crossed the Squirrel Level Road facing north. Wilcox overran Oscar Pegram's farm, but Heath was completely repulsed in his uh, attempt to advance southward on the Squirrel Level Road. In the fighting there, uh, the Yankees lost about 350 men, the Confederates about 400. But such uh, uh, similar casualties mac mask the complete disparity in the results. The whole Confederate counterattack had been thwarted, and the Yankees had secured their position around Peebles Farm. Meantime, to the south of the farm, down about here, the Union cavalry under David Gregg beat off efforts by Wade Hampton to get into the Yankees' uh, left rear. All day, Meade, still back at his headquarters behind the uh, the Union far right and slowly wending his way to the front was exhorting Warren and Park to resume advancing, but they would not budge. Everything depended on the arrival of fresh troops. General Gershom Mott's division of the uh, Federal Second Corps, some 5,800 men. And how would Mott's troops, and I go back a couple of maps here, General Mott's troops were here along the Jerusalem Plank Road. They were to come out and reinforce the field fort troops at uh, Peebles Farm. They were to arrive by railroad. This is the first time in American military history when railroads were used to transport troops tactically. Now, throughout the whole Civil War, they'd been used to transport troops strategically. And we heard in our Perspectives in Military History uh, program uh, earlier this season how Louis Napoleon had used railroads to good advantage in the Franco-Austrian War of uh, 1859. But here is a tactical movement by railroad from this quiet Union sector right around to the railhead at Globe Tavern, just behind the, the forward lines at Peebles Farm. The U.S. Railroad had been completed only on September 12th, and this exciting new technology seemed to have such opportunities. It beguiled Meade and his chief of staff, Andrew Humphreys, even General Grant himself. Grant would write to Ben Butler that if you can accomplish something on the peninsula, I'll rush two of Meade's corps to you by railroad. Well, in the event, the railroad could not transport even one division. The ability to execute the technology did not keep up with the technology itself, and the quartermasters, the logisticians who were responsible for the military railroads, couldn't get their cars in place, their railroad engines. It took all afternoon to move Mott's troops three miles. He could have marched even on that rainy, muddy day, he could have marched the distance. But nope, we were going to have the cutting-edge technology. 
and it just it didn't work in in this in this uh, sorry fred but uh, uh but still it was put uh, uh it, it was put to use so the rest of october 1st uh, was consumed in just getting Mott's men out to the front. Meade was going to have his grand advance on October 2nd. By now, we had 30,000 men in the field, uh, in the strike force, half of his entire command. And he envisioned a simple exercise in which his forces would move forward from Peebles Farm, and turn the position, defeat the Confederates on Pegram's Farm, advance and cut the Boydton Plank Road, maybe even the South Side Railroad. But when the Yankees got to Pegram's Farm, there were no Confederates there to fight. Where had they gone? Into the mists of that, that nether world that, that we call the, the grand tactical domain, where the enemy is no longer visible, but may be lurking in the creek bottoms in the woods, ready to launch surprise flank attacks. The same concerns for security that had so slowed the Union strike force on September 30th now again asserted itself. Meade had no interest in venturing into the unknown. So except for a little skirmishing up here around Mrs. Hart's and, and uh, W. W. Davis's, this grand offensive on October 2nd amounted to naught. By now, Grant had already lost interest in carrying on the 5th offensive. He was thinking ahead to his 6th offensive. But he had so much respect for me that he allowed me to prolong the battle into Sunday. But when me too lost interest, all of the, uh, the federal commanders on the south side were willing to bring the operation to a close. And even though Ben Butler wanted to keep going, Grant, uh, Grant reined him in. So the Bluecoats would pull back from their forward positions onto Pegram's and Peebles Farms. Here we see a close up. Here we see how they prolong the position from Globe Tavern out here to Pegram's Farm. In this whole battle of Poplar Spring Church, the Yankees lost. 2,950 men, the Confederates about 1,300. In the entire 5th Offensive, we've talked about this afternoon, there were over 6,300 blue-coated casualties, some 3,000 gray coats. Now, such spread of statistics suggests striking Southern success. Yet, do they record results rightly? On the peninsula, the Federals occupied New Market Heights, captured Fort Harrison, and expanded their presence north of James River from a bridgehead to an entire army sector. There, they represented a continuing threat, which Lee had to allocate a complete corps to contain. He could not afford to spare so many troops from Petersburg, but he could not afford not to do so either. Similarly, on the south side, Meade broke out from Globe Tavern, expanded his lines restward, and tightened his grip on the Greycoats. Especially importantly, he captured the key road junctions around Peebles Farm. From there, he would launch his next four offenses. Finally, on April 2nd, 1865, from ground seized in this Battle of Poplar Spring Church, he would break through near Hart's house, where he had been repulsed on October 2nd. That breakthrough doomed both Petersburg and Richmond, and within a week, the Army of Northern Virginia itself. Such disaster, however, lay six months in the future. It had appeared imminent on September 29th when the Bluecoats stormed Fort Harrison. Yet Lee and his outnumbered forces battled back boldly and bravely. They saved both the communications center and also the capital. From this direst of dangers, Richmond had been redeemed. And I thank you.
comments and questions from Dr. Keller. Okay, I think this is working, and I'm going to set the clock here to make sure I don't run over. There's so much interesting material that Dick has uh, brought out for us to think about today, uh, and uh, what I'd first like to, to say is uh, uh, compliments and kudos to you, Dick, for the republishing of this superb book, uh, which is regarded by Civil War scholars as still the quintessential example of solid Civil War research today. Uh, the joke is, and he's heard this, I'm sure, that the footnote section is bigger than the text. Uh, but uh, I, I don't quite believe that. Uh, I do believe that it is still a landmark work uh, of, of Civil War scholarship uh, and, and befitting of about three or four more republications, in my opinion. Um, it's an honor for me to be here and to, to make some uh, comments and observations about, uh, about uh, the talk and about uh, this subject. Um, Dick was a mentor of mine when I was younger, uh, way back in middle school years, when he was uh, still in, in Upton Hall uh, and overseeing the archives. So it, it's really quite a pleasure to be here. Um, a couple things I would simply like to, to, to bring out, uh, and this is for the audience uh, to, to think about also, some things to, to consider. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to think about the fifth offensive at Petersburg in the context of Grant's overall uh, military strategy, which he has worked out in coordination with the Union civilian authorities by this point in the war. He is general in chief of all the Union armies now, and uh, the entire uh, process of, of Union military advance at this point is uh, in the context of simultaneous advances on all fronts against the Confederates. The idea is don't allow them to shuffle troops back and forth from one set and, uh, threatened sector to the other. And so uh, he is trying very hard to ensure that there's no way, uh, as Dick mentioned, that Lee can dispatch troops uh, perhaps down to uh, Joseph E. Johnston uh, or uh, to any other point south uh, that are also under threat. And Grant is going to oversee operations in Virginia watching over George Meade's uh, shoulder uh, to the chagrin of Meade in some cases and also uh, uh, to his uh, benefit in, in others. Um, I think Dick's characterization of the Petersburg siege in the context of uh, the theater of war in the East and the rest of the war in general is, is right on target. And Really, this is why we care about Petersburg in the Fifth Offensive uh, as, as kind of a microcosm of the entire siege. Uh, Petersburg had incredible strategic significance for the reasons that he well laid out for us here. And I think we, we can't uh, overestimate why it mattered and, and why the siege actually ends up happening there. Because if Petersburg falls, Richmond is going to fall soon thereafter. And its logistical hub, uh, value, its communications hub value, uh, cannot be overstated, in my opinion. And uh, yet today, it, it's kind of a, the key into the, the back door uh, of Richmond. In 1864, it also possessed a symbolic value, which uh, I think we should think about as well. Uh, Petersburg was a major city. It, it was a manufacturing center. And its fall alone, regardless of what might happen to Richmond in any ensuing uh, uh, conflict, its fall alone would be a major blow to the South at this point in the war. Uh, remember other southern cities that have fallen at this point. Uh, if Petersburg goes, this is going to be a heavy blow. So symbolically also, I think we need to think about what Petersburg represents for the South. A um, couple other points I'd like to bring out. Uh, the fluid aspect of the siege here. Uh, I think Dick very uh, accurately characterizes this both in the book uh, and uh, in his talk about the fact this is not some static siege, which a lot of popular conceptions uh, that we have of the siege of Petersburg often bring to mind. This is a series of fluid battles and skirmishes of varying size uh, that occur in deep woods in many cases, not uh, in between open trench lines. Some of them did, but there were many uh, as we heard today, uh, such as People's Farm, that are, are really in, in really rough uh, wilderness, uh, second growth forest kind of terrain and, and uh, with cuts and ravines in the, in the ground. 
I've led staff rides down in this area. It, it is still very challenging terrain to just walk over today. Uh, and you can imagine what it would have been for the soldiers then. So this is, this is not just some static siege. This is a fluid series of battles uh, around siege lines that have been created by both sides. And the federal siege lines are often neglected as we talk about this. They too were absolutely massive, protecting the flanks of the federal army from any surprise attack from Robert E. Lee. Um, I think there's no question that, that he's correct, that Grant dominates the tactical, operational, and strategic aspects of this entire siege, uh, and uh, especially in the fifth, fifth Offensive. But I like very much, Dick, your characterization of Lee uh, taking advantage wherever he can and however he can. Lee still wants to, quote, strike those people a blow. And for him, this is an opportunity wherever and however he can to try to regain some sort of initiative at any level of war. And he's going to do that uh, in, in frequent uh, episodes during this offensive, as, as Dick illustrated, and, and also later on in the siege. Uh, so Lee is not down for the count. And again, this kind of contradicts a popular image that we have of Lee being cornered now, and he can't move, and he can't really uh, assert any of the old Lee-like character. Not true. Not true. He's, and he's, he's doing the best that he can. Um, on some of these other personalities, Ben Butler often gets a bad rap in uh, Civil War history and again in the popular imagination of the informed public. Uh, we know what happened to him down in New Orleans with the uh, chamber pots and, and he, he did kind of have a bad reputation as a political general at the time. But during this operation, Butler shows energy, he shows innovation, and he's also very interested uh, in uh, uh, making sure he has good intel. Uh, again, points that Dick brought out, I think, very admirably. So don't jump to the conclusions about Butler. This is a different Butler from the one that we've known earlier in the war. And uh, he also is an incredible advocate for the black troops and wants to give them a chance to shine. Uh, well, they definitely got their chance, but they also were slaughtered in, in great numbers at, at Chaffin's Bluff, as, uh, as Dick brings out. Longstreet, where is he? A lot of people are probably wondering, where was James Longstreet? Well, he's still out of action from his wound sustained in the wilderness. That's why he's not in this entire operation on the Confederate side. Just wanted to mention that for everyone's uh, knowledge. Ewell and Hill, who underperform arguably at Gettysburg, do well here. And I think it's important that we emphasize that Lee's right-hand men here are doing actually a pretty good job in uh, reacting to these emergencies that are being created by Grant, Butler, and Meade. And uh, uh, Ewell, in particular, I agree, does a very fine job here trying to rescue the situation uh, after uh, the Chaffin's Bluff disaster. A um, couple other quick points just to think about and to make sure that uh, I don't run over time. There were two Pennsylvania United States Colored Troop res regiments that uh, fought at Chaffin's Bluff uh, and uh, there were some medals of honor that were given to them. So we have a, a, a Pennsylvania connection uh, here, and it's often forgotten. Uh, this was one of, it is still considered today by historians of the African American experience in the Civil War as one of the great battles. We often look at the movie Glory. We look at the uh, fight at Battery Wagner uh, in July 1863. We think about Milliken's Bend, perhaps, or about uh, the massacre uh, uh, at Fort Pillow. But Newmarket Heights was one of the great, if not the greatest, action of black troops, USCT troops, in the American Civil War. Uh, and uh, they sustained very high casualties. Part of that had to do with the terrain. Part of that had to do uh, uh, with mismanagement in uh, tactical level leadership. And they, they did not come in uh, as several brigades. Instead, it was one brigade, then the next brigade. And, and this is part of the reason they did not overwhelm initially uh, the Confederate defenses. They were also facing what some historians have called Robert E. Lee's Grenadier Guard. They're facing the remains of the Texas uh, Brigade there uh, and, uh, and, and others who have fought very well and, and they're ready for them uh, when, they, when they come out. Dick is, I think, right on target about the significance of the fall of Fort Harrison and the significance of the lodgment that was achieved in the south at Peebles Farm. Why? because this sets the stage for the rest of the siege and for Grant's being able to, to, to increase this stranglehold on Petersburg so that when uh, Lee continues to suffer attrition by desertion, uh, just 
attrition through casualties, through disease, and when the Federals finally can start to push for their final offensives, there is no room to maneuver anymore. Uh, they, this fifth offensive pushes Lee against the wall. He's, he's really running out of his, his buffer, if you will, uh, geographically in the defense of Richmond and Petersburg. And I, th I really like that point, Dick. I think that's, that's right on target. Um, another thing to consider is the fact that the tactical level leadership of the Army of Northern Virginia has been so attrited by this point uh, that you have a situation such as he mentioned, where 8,800 Confederates failed to dislodge 2,200 Federals uh, in their attempt to recapture Fort Harrison. That's a sad statement of the leadership quality at the lower level of war for the Army of Northern Virginia. And I think it tells us about what has happened now after uh, two years of sustained operations by that organization. Uh, they no longer can continue to achieve the miracles. Uh, every time, yet they did do well in the initial attack at Peebles Farm. So there's an uneven performance record, and you can't just generalize, uh, which is something I hope that, that you'll take away from this talk today. Um, I think Dick's a little too easy on G.K. Warren uh, at, at Peebles Farm. I, I've always been a little harsher on him there, but that's okay. We'll have a little scholarly disagreement there. Uh, but uh, uh, other than that, uh, I think this is... Uh, a very, very important subject for us to consider in Civil War history, often neglected. Dick's book is, is must read for anyone is, who's interested in how the Civil War starts to wind down in the East. And the so what analysis historically of the Fifth Offensive and why it mattered, uh, I couldn't say it any better than Dick himself said it. Uh, this is now the beginning of the end uh, for Robert E. Lee's ability to maneuver uh, and to strike a blow at those people, uh, and the beginning uh, of Grant's uh, march towards victory. But there's no guarantee in war. And with that, I'll pass it over to my colleague. But might I, Chris? Oh, please. We, we please. go to Paul. Uh, thank you for your very, very gracious remark. Uh, just to pick up on a, a few points uh, now, and then I'll look forward to uh, your commentary, Paul. Uh, you mentioned the, the black regiments from, from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania was credited with 11 black regiments, which was far and away more than any other free state raised. Just by way of contrast, Massachusetts raised three uh, and raised a good many of them right here in South Central Pennsylvania, but they were credited to Massachusetts. New York had two, Ohio had two, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, Rhode Island, one each, Connecticut, a regiment and a battalion. In contrast to that paucity of numbers, Pennsylvania was able to raise 11 uh, black regiments, and there were quite a few that were involved in the, the siege of, of Petersburg. Uh, two uh, were uh, very ha hard hit uh, in the uh, attacks, but uh, there were about six that were in involved in the uh, whole force that's uh, involved in these these operations. Uh, I didn't go into a lot of tactical detail in this talk out of respect for time. It's uh, explored at, at length in the book, but in regard to this Confederate counterattack against Fort Harrison on September 30th, the um, Yankees thought the Confederates would be coming up from the southwest, so they were on guard against a danger from that direction, from the direction of, of James River. The, the rear, the, uh, I'll, I'll go back here a couple maps, even though we don't have the tactical maps here. Uh, the Fort Harrison is open in the rear. There was no gorge wall on the fort. And late on the afternoon of September 29th, the Confederates began a few minor probes to retake some of these lost trenches down here. The Yankees thought the danger would develop in that area. And it was only on the early afternoon, around midday of September 30th, that the danger began materializing up here from the, the northwest and the west. The Yankees did not have a gorge wall in place there at all. Only at the last minute did they begin fortifying, and their rampart was only ankle high. That really doesn't do much good. So it was a stand-up firefight 
between General Stannard's division. They had taken the fort on September 29th. They were defending the fort on September 30th against these Confederates who were counterattacking with the Confederates having an advantage of four to one, and yet the, the Confederate attack totally broke down and the, the Federals were able to hold the fort. Stannard himself went down with a wound that would cost him his, his right arm and end his service in the, uh, in the field in the Civil War, but he and his men uh, saved the fort. Now, Paul, I look forward to your comments. Well, thank you, Dick. Uh, thanks, Chris, as well, for doing a great job in reviewing what we've uh, heard this afternoon. I'm not going to try to uh, do the same thing that he so expertly did to talk about the campaign. Um, and I echo all of his comments about what Dick has done in this particular offensive with his book. Uh, if you want to know and start to understand how important this whole siege was and the active side of it, this is the book to read. And you will certainly have that flavor when you are finished. This, this is so important. This offensive is so important uh, as 1864 slowly comes to an end uh, for both armies and for a lot of reasons that Dick has very expertly outlined this afternoon. Uh, probably the only thing I wouldn't say that I, that I suspect Dick would be happy if I didn't say that I knew him when I was in high school. Uh, <laughs> but I think there are a couple of things that you could talk to us a little more about uh, that, that the audience would be very interested in understanding. I'm willing to bet that most everybody is familiar with Grant and his sense of political generals. Yet you've given some credit, as has Chris, to Ben Butler here. Could you talk a little more about this relationship between Grant and this anything but a really good military commander, but an expert politician? Could you talk a little more about that? Thank you, Paul. I, I would be pleased to. One of Grant's qualities as a general is that he tries to work with and through the subordinates uh, that he has. Uh, he identifies some who are very good, such as, as Sherman and, and uh, McPherson and Ord. Uh, in the Western Theater, he brings Ord uh, into his own army group here in, in July uh, of 1864. He has great professional respect for General Meade, for what he had accomplished at Gettysburg, and uh, continues to develop professional respect for Meade, uh, even though uh, Meade himself um, is seething internally under having a higher ranking general with him. But it's not just in working with and through Meade, but it's also with and through Butler. Butler had been placed in command of the Department of North Carolina and Virginia in um, November of 1863. And when the large federal garrisons along the Atlantic coast were uh, concentrated into the mobile field army of the James in the spring of 1864, the hope was that Butler would remain back at his headquarters in Fort Monroe and allow a professional soldier, a preferably Baldy Smith, and we here in Carlisle all know about Baldy Smith and our Titanic Battle of Carlisle, don't we? Uh, well, General Smith had uh, earned Grant's uh, respect in raising the siege of Chattanooga. Uh, he would be assigned to command the 18th Corps uh, for the spring offensive, and Butler thought that, or, or uh, Grant thought that Smith could even command the, uh, the whole army of the James, but Butler insisted on taking the field, and Grant recognizes the political considerations that are at play in a republic at war. Political generals are part of the overall command structure. And even here at the Army War College, at the very apex of the Army professional military educational system where we further hone the, the professional development of the future professional military leaders of our armed forces. 
even here we should make the point that in the 19th century the American military was still operating under the model that had been formulated by the founding fathers based on the ancient Roman Republic as they understood it. Now, maybe they didn't have a perfect understanding, but it was their understanding. A republic was a, a form of government, not the mob rule of a Athenian mass a democracy, but a representative republic in which the virtuous citizen participated in the public things, the race publica, which is the Latin root of the word republic. The citizens voted, served on juries, held government office, and in time of war took up arms to defend the republic. And the corollary of this is that the fellow citizens who were leaders of their fellow citizens in civil life, maybe the governor, maybe the senator, maybe the would-be governor or would-be senator or would-be president, was the natural leader of the fellow citizens in wartime. So if we don't dismiss these officers as political generals, but call them citizen generals, they are consistent with this model. They had been used in the War of 1812 in the, in the Mexican War, not with great success in the Mexican War, but they had certainly been used, and they would continue to be used in the Civil War. And so the challenge of the professional military officers who were uh, being assigned increasingly responsible subordinate and, and command positions in the Civil War, still had the responsibility of working with these citizen generals. And there were some very good citizen generals in this war. One of them commanded a division right in these operations, Alfred H. Terry, a Connecticut lawyer, who had started out as Colonel of the Sixth Connecticut by this period of the war. He would be a division commander by mid-October, he'd be leading a corps. He would finally take that amphibious expedition down the Atlantic coast in January of 1865 and capture Cape Fear and thereby earn a star in the regular army under which he would continue to operate in the post-war period. And one can think of John A. Logan and, and young Frank Blair and uh, Benjamin Grierson, and many other uh, very good citizen generals, including uh, political generals in the Civil War. Now, Ben Butler is not in, in their class. But as you say, Paul, neither is Ben Butler someone devoid of, of professional ability. He has a very creative mind. He can draw on military intelligence. But in, in the book, and there wasn't time again to dwell on it in my talk, but I'm happy for the opportunity to bring it up now. These operations also show one of Butler's greatest shortcomings. Unlike Lee, unlike Grant, unlike even Meade, who strove to master events, Butler was buffeted by events. His strength was military intelligence. It was also his weakness. As information would come into him, if the intelligence was positive or encouraging, his uh, spirits would soar about a great opportunity to, to achieve so much. But when these prisoners of war that he captured after the failed counterattack on Fort Harrison on September 30th told him that, well, we have... Charles Field's division, that's Hood's old division from, from Gettysburg, and uh, Robert Hoke's division, and Henry Heath's division, and the Light Division. Heath and, and the Light Division weren't there at all, but the prisoners of war told Butler they were in front of him. And previously, Butler had thought he could beat the whole army of Northern Virginia, but now, faced with the supposed threat of having four divisions massed against him, he, he plunged into despair and was 
saying, our situation here is desperate. You must send me reinforcements. And finally, Grant just got fed up with him and corked him back in his bottle and, and told, to, told him to, uh, uh, you know, just make the best fight you can with the troops you have, because I don't have anyone else to, to send you right now. Um, so there were these, these strengths and, and these weaknesses both, but Grant understands he has to work with these people. And uh, it would only be when Butler would destroy his own chances when he attempted to, to blow up the uh, Confederate fort on Cape Fear, Fort Fisher, with a powder boat. And uh, in fact, he blew up his own military career, not uh, <laughs> literally, but, but figuratively. It was a total fiasco. And by then, the election was over. President Lincoln was overwhelmingly reelected, the, and uh, by then, it was thought to be politically safe to remove Butler from command. But he would remain an influential figure in the uh, radical Republican Party. He'd been a conservative Democrat in 1860, but by for this period of the war and post-war, he was a radical Republican. He would manage the impeachment against Andrew Johnson in 1868. Um, so he continues to be a, a, an a very influential figure. And I, I go in depth into analyzing his generalship in, in the book. Thanks, Dick. I, I know that was that was great, and I know that people really enjoyed hearing that kind of discussion about why it is so important that Grant has got to work with these leaders that he has, regardless of what he thinks of them. Yet there's, I think, another thing that the audience would be very interested in that is not at the top level, but probably at the bottom level, and we've alluded to it here a little bit this afternoon. Anyone that's read the book or will read the book will be absolutely amazed at the detail that you provide on the units that are now fighting these fights. Yet I know that all of us are familiar with uh, 35 miles south of us here. What the Army of the Potomac was in July of 1863 is something different a year plus later. And could you talk to us about the two armies and why these armies now are so different than what they were at the height, some would say, of their abilities in 1863. What's changed? Thank you, Paul. That, that's a great question. A lot that has changed in the Army of the Potomac is the personnel at all levels from enlisted man right up to major general. The Union troops were enlisted in the volunteer establishment for a maximum tour of duty of three years. So the forces that had been raised in the summer and autumn of 1864 had their terms uh, about to expire, or in 1861, the summer and autumn of 61, their terms were about to expire in 1864. The Union Army had twice earlier in the war lost experienced manpower. The two-year regiments that went out after Chancellorsville and the nine-month regiments that went out in the summer and, and autumn of 1863. They could not afford to lose the three-year regiments also. So they offered all sorts of re-enlistment uh, inducements, uh, bounties to re-enlist, the opportunity to, to have a 30-day furlough uh, back home, the opportunity to preserve uh, one's name honored on, on battlefields from, from uh, Williamsburg to, to Gettysburg and beyond, the right to call oneself a veteran regiment. Some officers even provided additional personal inducements. The, the colonel of a Michigan regiment serving out in Arkansas, but it was the same principles here, he said, any of my men who re-enlist will get an autographed photo of me. <laughs> but many Union regiments did re-enlist, but many did not. The whole Pennsylvania Reserve Division, 13 infantry regiments, none of those regiments re-enlisted as a unit. There were enough individuals left to create two new regiments, the 190th and 191st. Uh, but none of them re-enlisted. Many, many of the veteran regiments did not stay in service. There were newer regiments that were, had joined the Union Army. A few joined 
in the spring of 1864 who were new. Many heavy artillery regiments that had been garrisoned in Washington and Baltimore were brought into the field in mid-May of 1864 to serve as infantry, and they would continue serving uh, for the, the duration of the siege. They were large regiments. There's something to be said for simply being in service, in uniform, under arms, under discipline, under training, even if you're not in combat. That renders troops far more effective than if they are simply fresh fish that have come right, uh, right to the fighting front, whether it's at First Bull Run or South Mountain and Antietam, uh, or even here later on in the Siege of Petersburg that have only uh, been in service for, for a few weeks or maybe a month. Uh, the, the training and experience the troops got in the heavy artillery garrisons uh, gave them a considerable measure of combat uh, effectiveness when they would finally reach the Army of the Potomac and the Army of the James or the Army of the, the Shenandoah in, in 1864. Uh, we, we can look at uh, Stannard's brigade at, uh, at Gettysburg, the 2nd Vermont Brigade. Uh, it fought in only one battle of the whole Civil War, July 2nd, 3rd, 1863, and look what it had accomplished there, because even though they had only about two weeks left to serve, because those troops had been under discipline and training. Well, you can say the same thing about the heavy artillery regiment. But then there, the new regiments that were being raised under the call uh, for one-year troops in the summer of 64, they started reaching the front in mid-September, and one of them would be actively engaged in these battles, 198th Pennsylvania, um, three others, the uh, 203rd Pennsylvania, the uh, 210th Pennsylvania, 185th New York would help to hold the uh, trenches to the rear. But they would be, these a lot, lot of troops arrived in the course of October, some of them would be committed to action in the 6th Offensive at the First Battle of Hatcher's Run on October 27th, and they would break and run under fire, just like the fresh fish had done at Antietam and, and, at, first, and at first Bull Run. So you have these new units, but also even for units that have been in service since 1862 or even since 1861, they're not necessarily the same individuals who are still there. Some individuals have not re-enlisted, but even those who have. When they, who goes into the forefront of the fight? The captains, the sergeants, the bravest of the privates, the field grade officers. There was terrible mortality, or at least casualties, among these officers in the spring campaign from the wilderness through Cold Harbor to the great failed assault of June 18th at, at, at Petersburg. And I'm not blaming General Grant for that. And perhaps we'll have an opportunity to talk about Grant's generalship later, but I want to keep the focus on this very important point that you raised, Paul. These casualties lower the fighting edge of the troops. And there comes a time when even shock troops go into shock, and even crack troops crack. And we see this with Hancock's 2nd Corps at the Second Battle of Reims Station on August 25th, which is just routed and flees in gloriously from the battlefield to the great sh mortification of Hancock. But it happens, and that was a reason why the 2nd Corps was left back in the trenches to hold the works. And the 1st and 2nd Division is not sent into action this time. Only Mott's division, which had not suffered the debacle at 2nd Ream Station, was brought forward uh, by railroad uh, to fight on, on October 2nd. But these units will often have individual replacements, but it is a misunderstanding of Civil War manpower policy to say that Confederates never raised new units but only put individual recruits into existing units, whereas the Union Army 
always raise new units and never put individual replacements into existing units. In point of fact, both armies used both approaches. The Confederates did more of putting individuals into existing units, whereas the Yankees did more of creating new units. But there was a lot of putting these individuals into existing units. And who were these individuals? Well, many of them were bounty men. And there's nothing wrong with accepting an enlistment bonus if you intend to serve. But if you intend to jump and get back to the north and collect another bonus, or at least not risk your hide, uh, these, uh, these bounty men were a, uh, especially individual replacements, were a lower class of fighting men. They would have to be brought under guard from the troop rendezvous in the north to the armies in the field. But still, when they get there, they would be put into these units. The 5th New Hampshire, think of the 5th New Hampshire at Antietam. Think of Colonel Cross in the 5th New Hampshire in the wheat field at Gettysburg. The 5th New Hampshire had to be virtually locked inside Fort Stedman with a different regiment guarding the sally port so it could not desert to the Confederates. There was almost a dynamic equilibrium of Union soldiers deserting to the Confederates and Confederate soldiers deserting to the Yankees at this period of the war. And it would not be until the, the overwhelming re-election of President Lincoln and the repudiation of the Peace Democrat Party of the North on the one hand and Sherman's march to the sea on the other hand that Confederate uh, desertions would far exceed Union desertions. But coming back to another element of what you're saying, um, what you're asking about, not only the bounty men, but there were a lot of individual replacements from, from Europe. And I know, uh, Chris, you have certainly uh, studied the, the German regiments at Chancellorsville and Gettysburg and the important work that you've done there. And there were some German regiments here, the 5th Pennsylvania Cavalry, the, the 46th New York were German regiments. But these were individual German replacements from the Rhineland or from Belgium um, or from the south of Ireland that had been enticed to come over here, uh, could not violate the neutrality laws of Queen Victoria or the King of Belgium or the various uh, Germanic monarchs to overtly recruit in their territory. So you just say, if you'd like a job, come here, get on a boat, come to America. And when they arrive in Boston or, or New York or Philadelphia, they find the only job available is to go into the army. So were there a lot of men like that that had been put in as fillers and replacements in the existing units? The, the 35th uh, Massachusetts Regiment, a New England Yankee Regiment, was so filled up with German uh, replacements uh, in mid-September of 1864 that uh, uh, the regimental historian said they should have changed their name to the First, ha first Hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, when they went into the fight here at Poplar Spring Church, the officers couldn't speak German, and the enlisted men couldn't understand English, and the, uh, the regimental commander in his after-action report uh, would write that uh, we really accomplished nothing in the battle, and except for the evident propriety of staying on the battle line and suffering casualties along with everybody else, we could just as well have withdrawn from the field because we weren't doing anything. Well, that's a lowering of tone. Now, over the winter of 64, 65, as some of the wounded men come back, as some of the new uh, individual replacements and new regiments uh, become more experienced, the fighting edge will rise within the, uh, the uh, Army of the Potomac. Certainly, the Army of the Northern Virginia continues to suffer from attrition. And we have attrition, not only of the enlisted men, but of senior leadership. You look at so many of the generals who were serving in the Confederate Army at, at Gettysburg or in the Union Army, they will be dead by this period of the war or, or wounded out. And um, the casualties will be terrible. The, the, uh, I mentioned only one Union general was killed in the whole siege, but uh, the Confederates lost uh, 10 generals in the uh, 
or, or nine, nine generals and two colonels commanding brigades. The disparity is, of course, in the Union Army, rank often lagged an echelon or grade below office. So many brigades were led by colonels, and the blue coats lost 18 or 19 colonels commanding brigades, but only one general officer who would be killed in battle, and that would be Hiram Burnham. And Fort Harrison would be renamed Fort Burnham in his honor. Well, I've, I've abbreviated my answer in respect for time. <laughs> uh, Dick, I think that's wonderful. Uh, I know that there are so many more questions I'd love to ask, and I'm sure Chris shares the same feeling, but I suspect our audience has some questions they'd like to ask as well. So I think it may be appropriate for us to yield the remaining time to them. Please. I know that there was oh, this sold out. <laughs> I know that there at the time there was no formal doctrine of uh, command and control, but you know in the Civil War things were changing rapidly. But how would you? I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Summers, but anybody on the panel can answer. How would you assess like uh, Grant's ability to exercise command and control? You know, and his subordinates in that in the, in those terms, uh, how were they functioning? Because I mean, I, I look at Lee and I and the way he functioned, and he really had no staff. And I'm always kind of think, well, <laughs> there was not much in the way of command and control there. But anyway, I'd just like to hear about Grant and his subordinates. We don't often hear about it. Thank you. That's, that, that's an excellent question. In the short term, Grant does not have much of a staff either. The, the huge staffs that we have in our armed forces today are creations of the, the 20th century. Um, and continuing on to the present time. Uh, both Grant's personal staff and uh, Lee's personal staff were, were quite small. Now, in fairness, at Army Group level, and I should say that the term Army Group isn't an anachronism. It was not in parlance in the Civil War. That, too, for the United States, is a construct of the 20th century. But it is so accurately descriptive. An army group is a group of armies that I have not hesitated to use it in this presentation. Um, but for Sherman, who was commanding an army group in Georgia, for, for Grant, who was commanding an army group here in Virginia, most of the staff bureaus continue to function at the army level, the, the quartermaster, the the commissary of, of subsistence, the, the engineers, and there would be much smaller representation of that uh, at Army Group level, although Grant would bring his friend Rufus Ingalls up to function as the, the quartermaster of the, the whole Army Group. But coming back now to how they exercised command and control, in these battles that I have talked about, Grant went to the peninsula on all four days to observe what was happening on Ben Butler's front. He did not assume direct command. That was not an army commander's function, let alone an army group commander's function, to assume direct command. But he went there to observe what was happening. This, after all, was Ben Butler's first battle as an army uh, commander under Grant. He had not led an army in the field since the uh, Second Battle of Drury's Bluff on, on May 16th, uh, when he was in quasi-independent uh, uh, command in, in Chesterfield County, and had been totally defeated and was lucky to escape back into, into Bermuda 100. So Grant obviously wants to keep an eye on how Butler is, is going to operate. And he has some crucial meetings with Butler on... Uh, uh, the morning of, of September 30th, and uh, again during the day on October 1st and October 2nd. And he, he never quite finds Butler on September 29th or Ord either, uh, but he actually does reach Fort Harrison and is under fire at Fort Harrison. And uh, shells are exploding over his head, and he continues to write dispatches to General Meade and to President Lincoln back in... Um, in Washington as to what as to what is going on. Then Grant returns to his central depot at, at City Point. Uh, he will rely on 
messages to remain in communication with Butler, handwritten messages, the, the telegraph will not be extended to the front until October 1st. Grant never once goes out to visit Meade or the Army of the Potomac, his left wing, during these operations. He remains in telegraphic communication with Meade. The telegraph line runs all the way to Globe Tavern, and then um, they must rely on couriers to take the messages from Globe Tavern out to, to People's Farm. It's not because he doesn't think what's happening below Petersburg is important. He understands it's very important, but uh, he has sufficient professional confidence in Meade that he's sure that the Army of the Potomac will be in good hands uh, with, with Meade directing it and that Grant should devote his attention the greater to, uh, to uh, uh, keeping an eye on what Ben Butler is doing. I'd only put a slightly finer point to that. I don't think Grant has any issues with command. I think he's very clear in what he wants done. The bigger challenge for him is the control part. And that's that remains even today. I'm sure everybody in the room that's ever served would agree that control is far more difficult. And as Dick said, to get in the telegraph as far forward as they do later after these battles uh, is one of the keys to success for him. So it's a real, I, I think it's important just to make that distinction. I don't think you have any issue with command. So at this, uh, at this point, how does the speed of communication affect the use of intelligence? And how do, you, uh, how do you make effective use of intelligence given the speed of communication or the lack thereof? Another good question, and thank you for that. We've mentioned the telegraph, but we need to keep in mind a telegraph is not the telephone. It's not as if you can pick it up and communicate with a person on the other end of the line instantaneously. It takes some time for messages to be uh, transmitted uh, along the wires. And sometimes it will even take uh, half an hour or an hour uh, or more. And then if the recipient is not at the other end of the line, then the message has to be written and a, a courier or a, an aide has to deliver it to him at the uh, uh, wherever he may be, if he if he can be found. So um, that slows things down. But even where it did exist, the telegraph was an instrumentality of strategic and operational communication, but not tactical communication. You wouldn't have telegraph wires strung along the battle line at at Peebles Farm and the Squirrel Level Road, or or inside Fort Harrison uh, to communicate. So it's, it's just how Grant's headquarters, Army Group headquarters at City Point can communicate with Butler and Meade in the field, how uh, Lee from his headquarters, which he moved from Petersburg up to Chaffin's, how he can still uh, stay in touch with his commanders at both fronts. Now in terms of intelligence, by this period of the war, the Union Army knows the Confederate order of battle, down to all the regiments and all the brigades in uh, uh, all of the Confederate forces uh, that are at Petersburg. And there are three Confederate armies here, the uh, Army of Northern Virginia, of course, Ewell's Department of Richmond, and the residue of Beauregard's Department of Southern Virginia and North Carolina, although Beauregard himself has left on September 23rd, his staff is continuing to operate at headquarters and his, uh, his nine brigades are still uh, serving in this area and, and Lee needs to uh, remain in, in, in touch with them. When prisoners of war are taken, um, there, there's a very sophisticated intelligence analysis system in the Army of the Potomac uh, to, uh, and in Butler's army too, for that matter, uh, to assess what units are represented. If you take prisoners of war uh, from troops in, uh, in Hoke's division, well that must, at Fort Harrison, then that must mean that Hoke has moved from the Petersburg area where he was last identified up to participate in the counterattack at Fort Harrison. That there was an instance in which 
the Yankees, Army of the Potomac, thought they had taken prisoners from the 8th Georgia Infantry. Well, that was part of Charles Field's division, Ty Anderson's uh, uh, brigade. And yet they had also found signs that Anderson's brigade was in the counterattack on Fort Harrison. So they surmised the Confederates must have divided their regiments to have some still serving on the Petersburg front, others serving uh, north of James River. Well, in point of fact, it was not the 8th Georgia Infantry, it was the 8th Georgia Cavalry uh, from whom they had captured the prisoners on, uh, on Peebles Farm. Uh, so there was a temporary uh, misunderstanding there. The um, unit had previously been called the 62nd Georgia Mounted Infantry and it only recently changed its designation to the 8th Georgia Cavalry. Well, the, the Yankees soon resolved that matter, but uh, th that shows the detail in which they have an understanding of what the uh, order of battle is of the opposing forces. It's reasonable to assume that the Confederates had comparable capability, but I have to say, we cannot evaluate the Confederates in as rigorous a detail as we are able to explore the Northerners in this battle simply because the records have not survived. There are very few such records in the published official records, the 128 volume compilation that the US Army brought out in the late 19th century, or even the supplement to the official records that was published in the late uh, 20th century by the Broadfoot Publishing uh, Company. One can track down some of these documents in, in archives around the country, but many of them, unfortunately, were destroyed. For earlier in the war, for Bull Run, for Antietam, certainly for Gettysburg, where Confederate records were sent from the front to the Confederate War Department in Richmond. They were taken from Richmond on April 2nd, 1865, as part of the Confederate evacuation. Because the Southerners thought they were going to set up a new government in Danville or somewhere else, just like the Patriots of 1776 had set up a new government in Lancaster or York after they had had to uh, evacuate Philadelphia in 1777. So they took their records with them. And then they took those records down all the way to Charlotte, North Carolina. But when it became clear the Confederacy was collapsing, uh, Samuel Cooper, the adjutant general of the Confederate Army, who had been the adjutant general of the United States Army until he went south in 1861, he preserved all those records. He could have destroyed them at leisure, but he preserved them until the U.S. Army could take possession of them as a legitimate prize of war. And those records have now come to us through the War Department and the National Archives and published in the official records. But for 1864, the records were all being sent to Lee's headquarters so he could write his master report of the whole campaign, just as Grant would write his master report of the whole campaign. Well, Lee never wrote it and the war ended, and then there was no point. Lee probably would have written it, but on the retreat from Petersburg, Union cavalry intercepted the Confederate wagon trains near Painesville and Flat Run and destroyed some of them. But most of them made it all the way to Appomattox. And it was only on the morning of April 9th, 1865, when it became clear that the butternuts would not break out and that Lee was going to surrender, that clerks at Lee's headquarters destroyed all of those records, all of those intelligence reports, all of those telegrams and dispatches, all of the after action reports that brigade and division and corps commanders had sent up to army headquarters. They were all destroyed. Lee didn't want that to happen. When he learned of what had been done, he was terribly upset, but by then it was too late and it's a, a terrible loss to history. And so we're not able to delve as deeply and, and with as much granularity into the administration of the Confederate Army as we can with the Federal Army. But it is certainly plausible to surmise that the Confederate had an intelligence system comparable to uh, what the Yankees used on their side. I'll add a couple things to this. Um, 
first to address the issue of communication. Remember the Confederates are working on interior lines in the Petersburg siege, so operationally at least, uh, they have the advantage of being on the Jomanian interior lines. It should be a term that, that many people are familiar with, idea that you can shuffle troops back and forth, communications better when you're on the inside of a circle than if you're on the outside of a circle. And, and Dick's slides kind of give you an indication here. The Union semicircle is much greater or so uh, in, in, in length. And theoretically, therefore, the Confederates should have an easier time in, in shuffling communications as well as, as men back and forth. Uh, and, and I think that this is borne out by the history of the siege. They're able to shuffle back and forth. Leadership has something to do with that also. It's not just the, the geography. Um, the other thing that I would, I would add is the Confederates do have in the, in the realm of intel, they do have a home field advantage uh, in the sense that there are local people still uh, who are happy to inform on, on Yankee movements. Interestingly, though, uh, uh, as Dick points out and as others who've written on this offensive and others have pointed out, there's uh, less and less of that uh, at this point in the war than there, there was earlier and in other points of the Confederacy and in other points in Virginia. But there, you, there's still this home field advantage that the Confederates have uh, to some degree that's helping them gain some intel. Uh, and they're also purposefully spreading false intel. Some of those prisoners who were captured uh, at uh, Chaffin's Bluff and in other subsequent battles are purposefully spreading false information. Uh, this is an old Confederate tactic that had been used earlier in the war, and it's still being used uh, at this point. And this is uh, actually creating some misinformation, which is the purpose, uh, and leaves uh, very aware of the power of misinformation. Uh, so this is being done as well. Just some few points to, to add some more to your question. I think what makes this topic so fascinating is as we've had accurately described the, the kind of intelligence that the commanders had, they have no analysis center. Who's doing that analysis? And I think what makes it so fascinating for all of us when we visit the battlefields is to, we, we hear these big names and they get a piece of information. How do they decide what to do? Who do they turn to? Probably very few people, two maybe at the most. And they've got to make decisions based on, is it accurate? Is it, in, is it should I believe it? And that's what I think makes the Civil War so fascinating in so many ways. For today, we have all kinds of folks that will work analysis for us and provide us information. And so you have a, you have a plethora of information to have to sort through to decide. They don't necessarily have that in those days. So why do we defend to, to the southwest at the, at the fort here on the slide that's depicted? What makes them think that's the way they're coming? And why do they deploy their forces that way? What's standard thinking? And that's the challenge that we have. There is no way to know. And, and that's a great uh, point, Paul. And just to uh, uh, follow up a, uh, a bit on it in light again of what I had mentioned earlier, nowadays we think of a G3 or a DESOPS. Well, there was no operations officer at Army headquarters or Corps headquarters in the Civil War. The commanding general was his own operations officer. And he developed the tactical and operational and even strategic plans to try to, to accomplish the results, but did not have a very refined staff system to uh, develop potential plans and make recommendations to him. Lee's getting worn down by this process, by the way. Uh, he is getting extremely tired, worn out, and though he's not in active campaign mode as he had been in previous years, he's, he's, he's becoming very tired. Uh, he doesn't have the staff that can, that can process this. He has to do it himself. And his chief go-to guys, his chief lieutenants, um, and we'd like to, to, to discuss today how important it is for leaders at any level of war, especially strategic and operational, to have someone they can trust as a sounding board, they can talk to, and uh, uh, with whom they have a very frank, inherent understanding of affairs. Uh, he's limited now in who he can do that with. As I look at these, 
at this picture right here, and you see the red lines, and that's supposed to designate the, the Confederate forces, right? Yes. Was, were they trenches, or were they just uh, uh, like natural fighting positions? And also, when the Federals would approach them, would they dig in and fight them as in trench warfare? Let me uh, return to the map to, uh, to illustrate a, a point. Um, I'll go back one, in fact. This forward line out here to Newmarket Heights and continuing on up across the Charles City Road to White Oak Swamp, that was a trench line that had been created starting only in June of 1864 in reaction to when the Yankees crossed from Bermuda 100 and established their bridgehead here at Deep Bottom. That was a simple trench line. The rest of these are permanent fortifications uh, of Richmond, uh, supposedly a very refined uh, with ramparts, in many cases even with moats. Fort Harrison had a large moat uh, around it. We recall that when General Lee succeeded to command the Army of Northern Virginia in June 1st of 1862, one of the first things that he did was to begin constructing fortifications around uh, Richmond up here, especially in this area from the Williamsburg Road up to the Chickahominy. His, his soldiers even mocked him as the king of spades for spending time digging in. Um, those fortifications would be greatly elaborated and refined over the two uh, succeeding years. However, they were not built, for all the effort devoted to them, they were not built to perfect education or uh, military uh, professional standards. Here at Fort Harrison, it's atop a hill, but it has no glacis or glacis to provide a smooth field of fire. Uh, the Yankees charging across Childry's Field are exposed, but once they get up to the base of the hill, there's no way um, that the defenders can direct fire on them. And then when the Yankees again come up and jump into the moat, the Confederates can't fire into their own moat. There are no bastions protruding out from the uh, of ramparts to allow flanking fire. So while they are sophisticated in their profile, they are seriously lacking in uh, uh, military, uh, uh, the, the requirements of a good defensive position. Now, as to what the Yankees would do, um, Butler gave explicit orders he said, there are only a handful of Confederates on the peninsula. You are to go forward and attack. Don't stop. Don't engage in artillery fire. Are any of you officers here or veterans of the artillery branch? Any? Okay, well, good. Uh, in the sense that uh, I'll just point out that Butler forbade any Union artillery to cross James River with a strike force because he didn't want to uh, bog down in a bombardment. Uh, his plan was he was supposed to go forward and just storm the Confederate position, overrun the handful of defenders, and press on to Richmond. That, that was the plan. Well, no sooner did Ord come up the Varina Road, and he saw this Confederate position here, than he wanted to entrench before it and try to bypass it. And it was Stannard who persuaded Ord, no, let's just charge and storm the position, and that's what they did. And they broke through and, and captured the fort. The, the Yankees um, and the Confederates understood the, uh, the importance of fortifying. So on the night of September 30th, and well, this is the, well, the, the morning of September 30th, overnight, they would try to construct field trenches to refuse their left flank down the Varina Road to where they had crossed on their new pontoon bridge at Aiken's Landing. The pre-existing Confederate exterior line, which they had occupied without resistance, except on its lowest extremities where the Varina Road passes through it, they reversed it. So it now faced west towards the Confederates, and they would use that 
um, really for a good part of the, the rest of the siege. So, uh, and it would be a, a comparable situation on the, uh, the south side. The, um, the Yankees would take the captured Confederate line across Peebles Farm and reverse it and use it as their line, but then they built new works to refuse their flank, running back eastward towards Globe Tavern. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Maybe more of a general question on the siege mentality. Clearly, things are winding down. You said Lee is tired. There's not a lot of room. They knew the war was, was, was going to be over in the future. Nobody could predict when. And I'm wondering what they were, what they were thinking. Was it was, let, let's just hold off here and there'll be a political settlement? Or was that just let's hold off for the pride? Or you know, the, the so whole psychology that's going on now at the end uh, is, is interesting. And I wonder if you would comment on that, because I'm trying to get it through my head on just why, why do it? I mean, I'm tired. Let's just quit. Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at that, and, and I'll take at it, a stab at it from both sides. That's a really great question. Um, from the federal side, we know that Grant was somewhat concerned about launching an offensive this close to the federal election, which you know is coming up in November 64. And he doesn't want to have an outright defeat or even the perception of a defeat be promulgated throughout the North. So he's somewhat concerned, and, he, and, and I, I cautious would be too strong of a word, but he knows what's at stake, and he knows that the, the, every operation that he undertakes will be minutely looked at by the Northern press and reported upon. And no one yet knows in uh, uh, this, at this point in the war for certain that Lincoln's going to be reelected. There have been some victories that point in that direction, sure, but Grant, very, very aware of the political situation because he's a leader, one of the few federal leaders, I would argue, military leaders in the war, who was able to uh, uh, bridge that gap, that civil-military relations gap, uh, between being a high-ranking military commander of an army uh, uh, and, and indeed of, of the entire federal forces, he was general in chief by this point, and, and get into the head also of his commander in chief, President Lincoln. So there's some concern, maybe reticence uh, tailored to, to, to uh, making sure that this turns into something that's going to get us closer to victory. So he wants to make sure that whatever happens here, that it is not perceived as a defeat, and that indeed it moves us closer to victory, because Lincoln can't afford defeats uh, at this at this point, uh, even after some of the other events that have preceded this uh, in uh, in other parts of the of the country, from the Confederate perspective, they are still holding out hope for the for the election to throw Lincoln out. Uh, there is a great deal of uh, what we today would term false hope. They don't see it as false hope in their context. They see it as still an opportunity that uh, could go their way, and that indeed. Uh, Lincoln might get thrown out in November by uh, uh, those in the North who are tired of this war and have, have grown weary, and they're holding on. It, you don't see the mass desertions, for example, in the Confederate uh, ranks around G uh, Petersburg until uh, late fall after the election has taken place into the winter of 64, 65. But at this point, there's still a great deal of elan in the ranks, kind of a, a gritty resolution. Um, there are some other books that have come out uh, that have discussed this uh, earlier in the Siege of Petersburg and later in the Siege of Petersburg, uh, kind of uh, bookend uh, Dick's work. And it's, it's pretty obvious that the Confederates, on the whole, are still holding out hope that they can, pull the, that, that they can win this if Lincoln's thrown out. Now, they, <laughs> there's a bit of a misperception about what McClellan, the Democratic candidate, would actually do from the southern side. Uh, the, everybody thought that for sure this would cause an armistice and then 
de facto independence for the Confederacy. And we know that uh, McClellan did not make decisions on his own. The Democratic Party uh, controlled a lot more of this process. But that's, that's a, a general answer uh, to your excellent question. Uh, th thank you, Chris. You've articulated uh, very well the, the attitude of uh, the Confederates who were sustaining the struggle. I think it's very important that we not telescope nine and a half months of the siege of Petersburg or all 11 months of what I like to call the Virginia campaign of 1864-65. Not telescope them into one instant at Appomattox and just assume that the Confederate cause was hopeless. We know the South lost. We know that Lee surrendered. We know that the Confederacy collapsed. The soldiers at the time did not know what the future would hold. And they tried to make that future turn out favorably to their side. And that's why they sustained the struggle. Yes, they were tired, but they had not given up. Not physically, not mentally given up. Certainly not by this period of the war. And in the course of reading probably thousands, if not tens of thousands of soldier letters from this period, looking for information on the battles and the operations. I cannot help but come across much information on their attitudes and their mindset. And as you said, Chris, many of them were looking forward and pinning their hopes on the election in the North hoping that the Lincoln administration would be repudiated, although there were some Confederates who said, well, it might be a problem for us if McClellan is elected because he might reach some kind of negotiated settlement that would lead to reconciliation and we would no longer remain independent. He figured that such an arch enemy as, as Lincoln would fight it out to the end and the Greycoats would beat him in the end and they could, could win the struggle. Well, Things obviously didn't work out that way, but our point is in late summer and early autumn of 1864, they're still thinking in, in those terms. But um, I, I certainly agree also uh, that General Grant is very conscious of the political realities and the need to sustain the, the political will in the North to prosecute the war. And obviously President Lincoln has that will, but he needs to be reelected to, to allow him to continue to apply it. But I don't think that makes Grant reluctant to, to go into battle. He's not going to be reckless, but he was, he was never reckless. Um, I see a lot of signs, not conclusive proof, but a lot of signs that Grant picked up the timetable for his sixth offensive to create a major victory just before the election. Um, he was confident he was going to get it, too. I, 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 I've alluded to the fact that Grant had lost interest in the 5th Offensive by October 1st, and he let Meade prolong it one more day. He is now thinking ahead to when he will strike his next blow, but to make sure he has enough force though his next blow will achieve a great victory. And where will that force come from? From Sheridan's victorious um, army of the Shenandoah. They plan to, to bring back um, seven divisions from that army. That's, that's the plan. Uh, in fact, the, the disposition of forces and the reason that Sheridan was absent before the Battle of Cedar Creek was that he was back in Washington planning what route uh, his troops would take to get back to Grant, whether they'd follow the Manassas Gap Railroad straight east from, from Front Royal or whether they'd go all the way back to the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad at Martinsburg and, and take it in. But the, the point is to bring Sheridan's troops back from the valley and to bring down all these new uh, one-year troops that have been raised in the north. And they are really flowing into the Union Army in prodigious numbers. And Ben Butler has arranged through the War Department to bring in a lot of black regiments from Kentucky to, uh, to join the 
the army of the chains. And Grant doesn't want to do anything at Petersburg until he gets these additional men so he can strike an overwhelming force. It's almost ideal campaigning weather uh, after the first frost on October 9th. The, the roads are dry, there's no rain, it's cool, brisk autumn air, not too hot, not too cold. All those days pass unused. Little fighting on October 13th, but Grant still wants to wait. They all pass unused until all these troops can get to him. Well, Cedar Creek on October 19th will, de even though it's a great Union victory, it will delay the Union uh, troops from Sheridan from arriving until uh, the infantry until um, uh, December, and the uh, cavalry won't get down until March of 65. And uh, these new troops from the north, they do come in, but as we talked about before, they're fresh fish with no combat experience. And yet, and yet on October 17th, Grant will launch his sixth offensive, simultaneous attacks by Butler and Meade on both sides of James River. Now, why does he move up that timetable? Well, I haven't yet found the conclusive piece of evidence, the smoking gun, if you will. But we do know that Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, um, Quartermaster General Montgomery Meigs, uh, Surgeon General Barnes, uh, many prominent generals from Washington and Republican politicians visit Grant in mid-October, about the 17th and 19th. And shortly thereafter, Grant begins making his plans to launch the 6th Offensive. Did Secretary Stanton let the general know that the president would be pleased if there could be a victory on the Petersburg front comparable to, to uh, Sheridan's victories in the Valley and what Sherman was achieving in, uh, in Georgia and what Admiral Farragut had done at Mobile Bay back in August? I don't know, but it's an interesting coincidence, and, and Grant will launch that attack and be completely repulsed on both fronts, and it doesn't hurt the president's reelection chances uh, one bit. So, so Grant is willing to make is willing to make the effort. He understands the political realities, but they do not deter him from going into to action. It's the military necessity of striking with overwhelming force. And he has articulated it earlier in the year. The more men we have, the sooner we can win the war. There's a little to be said as well from the Confederate side, which I really think is more of your perspective. Uh, Dix mentioned that most of the Confederate soldiers are still feeling pretty good about it. I think one of the great things to, uh, to look at is Lee, not as a field commander, but as a strategist. And why does he send early into the valley to start with? How do we affect the campaign, the political campaign in the north? Northern will is still very tenuous. Uh, Dick alluded to it during his speech. Uh, the book will go a little bit further in depth to it. But the whole idea of the diversion of forces from the Petersburg front into the valley could cause another Confederate victory up there. What happens if Early actually does get close to Washington and achieves something remarkable? How will that affect the northern will? And if he's able to affect northern will as, as he hopes to, maybe it won't be Lincoln's second term that we'd be talking about. That's not a subject for tonight. Could be an interesting one for later, but then the next follow-on, obviously, is why does he continue after the election? Uh, earlier, you alluded to uh, some common mythology about various personalities, Butler, for instance. Uh, could you speculate on how those mythologies grow up and evaluate any of your uh, influence in bringing more nuance to that mythology? <laughs> Well, uh, that's, that's an interesting question uh, because I'm actually working on, on, a, on a book now that's going to try to 
reassess, if you will, the lost cause myth mythology of, of Jackson and the Lee-Jackson duo, uh, and looking at it especially from the strategic perspective and uh, from the perspective of, uh, of, of command relationships. Um, in regards to, to this material, uh, you know, Ben Butler, we know, earns his odious reputation in the South by what he does at New Orleans when he's uh, commander of the captured city of New Orleans. And, uh, uh, you know, the, these preserved chamber pots actually exist today. They're worth quite a lot of money. If you can find an original one, they have been copied. And uh, you can buy reproductions, I understand. Uh, I don't think we have any of those in our offices, Paul. Not, 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 not yet. Um, but Butler was was reviled post Civil War uh, throughout the South, not as much as Sherman, uh, but he was definitely in in the New Orleans area in Louisiana, seen as one of the the bad guys uh, of of the Union, the Beast. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, I'm not exactly certain how far that extended uh, and and how deep into the 20th century. But we also know that you know in the North. Uh, he was considered by many, especially uh, his political foes, as being inept. And I think one thing that, that uh, Dick's work does a great job on is kind of clarifying, well, you know, Butler actually has redeeming qualities, and Grant understands how to use them in the context of, of, the, uh, of the, uh, the situation on the ground. In other words, making do with what you've got. Uh, that has been lost. I mean, the, the, you, you don't see very much redeeming mythological discussion of Ben Butler in, in uh, 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 the, the last half of the 19th century and into the 20th. It, it, there just isn't much out there, at least none that I know of. That sounds like a really good Civil War Journal article, actually, uh, that, that could be done at some point. Um, in, in regards to, uh, uh, you know, Yule and, and Hill, uh, they are still judged very, very much by what happens uh, at Gettysburg and uh, uh, what happens to a much lesser degree prior to this siege, but in the Overland campaign, Hill especially being seen as bungling in, in post-Civil War accounts, many of them except for his immediate partisans that defended him, uh, at the wilderness with uh, not preparing for, for Hancock's attack uh, on the uh, on the second day of the of, of the Battle of the Wilderness, uh, Hill redeems himself, frankly, in in Confederate memory, by getting killed at the end of the of the Siege of Petersburg. So uh, he goes down, regardless of of what happened before, mistakes made, uh, suffering from a venereal disease. Who knows how that affected his judgment earlier in the war? Uh, he goes down as one of the heroes of the defeated Lost Cause, uh, and uh, kind of uh, his difficulties are shuffled under the carpet. Yule, as you may very well know, is, is still pilloried yet today by Southern partisans for uh, not being Stonewall Jackson at Gettysburg on the, at the end of the first day, as I like to say. Uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, if you study the, the, the Fifth Offensive and, and other aspects of the Petersburg campaign, you can get a different picture of Yule. But, uh, and he does very well, uh, I think, in, in this campaign and in this offensive on the whole. Uh, but uh, Lee may have, by this point himself, somewhat distrusted Ewell's abilities. And perhaps it's part of the reason he was delegated to the command of the city of, of Richmond. Uh, uh, and uh, after the war, Ewell's reputation doesn't really uh, get elevated very much in the Lost Cause myth mythology. He's not one of the great pantheon uh, of Lee and Jackson and, and Stewart. Um, so, you know, to give you specifics would be difficult, but I can give you those generalizations. Um, does that help answer your question? <clears throat> How about your influence in changing some of the mythology? Well, I... Okay, well, one thing I'm going to do in my work, I can definitely tell you, is, is I'm going to try to look at the Lost Cause mythology head on uh, and, and, and look it squarely in the eye and not back down from it. And uh, I personally think that there was a great deal, if you, and this is getting off topic from our discussion today, but, but to answer your question, uh, it, it, there's a great deal that I think can be said uh, for the strategic value of Stonewall Jackson to the Confederacy, and that 
uh, when he is accidentally shot by his own men on the night of May 2nd, 1863, dies subsequently from uh, pneumonia, uh, that this is a strategic contingency point. And you can, I think, divest this. My research so far, uh, I'm, I've about, I'm about to begin writing this book, in fact, uh, very, very soon. Research is almost done. Uh, what I've discovered indicates that, yes, I mean, this is a strategic contingency point, and that there, there is very good grounds to make the argument that, that his death is one of those events in the war that changed its course. Uh, and uh, to speculate beyond that, well, what would he have done at Gettysburg? I don't want to go down that rat hole in my work, but uh, I think what I intend to do in my book is just look at this realistically. How was he valued by Lee? Uh, what was the relationship he had with Lee? How was he seen by the Confederate people? What did his death do to them? How did they recover from it? Uh, how did the uh, Confederate civilian leadership think about his death? How did this hamstring Lee's later operations? Uh, and importantly, what does it mean when your go-to guy is removed? Uh, because Lee, as we know, didn't quite have that kind of relationship with, with uh, James Longstreet. And Longstreet was as late as uh, his wounding in the Battle of the Wilderness in 64. He's, he's yearning to go back out to the West. Uh, and uh, when he goes out there uh, to the Tennessee Theater, he underperforms, comes back kind of like a, a disenchanted little puppy, and, and then uh, uh, is, is welcomed back by Lee with open arms. Uh, but he still hankers for independent command, still thinking that he's a part of a, a partner team with Lee, uh, almost. Um, it's not the same. It's not the same relationship. So this is what I intend to do in, in my book and kind of uh, look at it very, very clear-eyed, objectively, and, and assess Jackson and what he meant uh, at the higher levels of war for the Confederates' uh, chances for success. And to, to follow up on that, it response to your question, what I actually have done in my book is to point out some of the strengths and the contributions, uh, especially of Ewell. Uh, there is no doubt that he performed quite poorly in the field in the spring of 1864, especially at the Battle of Harris's Farm at the end of Spotsylvania on, on May 19th, and that Lee gently shunts him aside to take over the, the Department of Richmond. <clears throat> but the Department of Richmond is not a backwater. It is an integral part of the siege of Petersburg, and you will play an important part throughout the whole siege of Petersburg, uh, and especially on this day, on September 19th, where he rallies his forces, plugs the gap, until Lee can bring up his reinforcements from Petersburg. So actually through, through my book, as well as through Chris's future book and other writings, we've tried to come up with a more balanced and and judicious approach. But remember, Ewell is very crippled. He lost a leg at Groveton. And in my battles, he rides around strapped to his horse, as General Hood would ride around strapped to his horse after Chickamauga. This does not interfere on September 29th, but on September 30th, while he and General Anderson and General Lee are reconnoitering the lines, the horse trips and stumbles, and since Ewell is strapped to the saddle, he goes down with the horse and is badly banged up and scratched, uh, no internal injuries, but he's taken back to the rear. And he knows how dire the situation is. He insists on returning to the front, so he comes back to the front, completely wrapped up, and the First Corps Chief of Staff, General Sorrell, will say, Ewell looks like an Egyptian mummy. Uh, with just his little beak uh, and eye holes open and, and all <laughs> swathed in, in bandages. Uh, Sorrell just uh, recounts that as happening sometime in 1864. I have found the evidence that it happened on September 30th during my battles, and I'm able to give Ewell credit for his willingness to, to return. Uh, but his physical um, limitations suggest all the more the desirability of having a more active commander on the peninsula. And so Richard H. Anderson will be assigned to that on September 29th, and then when Longstreet returns to duty on October 19th, Longstreet will uh, be entrusted with the responsibility for the whole Richmond sector of the siege of Petersburg, and Anderson will be 
moved to command Beauregard's old troops, the new Fourth Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. Ladies and gentlemen, we have time for one more question and discussion. Do we have anybody over here? Bruce Canton's uh, first book on his trilogy about the Army of the Potomac, uh, the first uh, book is uh, Mr. Lincoln's Army. And it's obvious that uh, there was a lot of political uh, influence and interruption and interference. How, is, how did the other armies, how much interference or uh, political, maybe skullduggery, compare? you know, the armies out west compared to the Army of the Potomac? I, I think we should recognize the terms that we used. Again, I suggested a different way of looking at political generals, that maybe we'd want to call them citizen generals as opposed to professional military generals, even though our professional military obviously are American citizens as well. I would not use the word interference. And in the classes that I taught in the core curriculum of the Army War College and the graduate seminar that I continue to teach in the Department of Distance Education, I invite our professional military who are the students in these courses to be open to the fact that by definition, the president cannot be a meddler. By constitutional prescription, the president is the commander in chief of the army and navy of the United States and the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. Those are the verbatim words of the US Constitution and the, the Southern Constitution was exactly the same except it said the militia when called into the actual service of the Confederate states. The president has the right to be involved. That the president in any war would recognize and understand the stakes and thus be disposed to be involved is understandable. In a war in which the very life of the nation is at stake, whether it is preserving the United States or creating the Confederate states, the president is all the more going to become involved. He has a right to be involved. Great military men like Ulysses S. Grant and Robert E. Lee and George C. Marshall and Colin Powell and David Petraeus understand this and they work with their presidents as well as working for their presidents. And when they create the measure of assurance that they understand the president's involvement, the president will accord them greater latitude to apply their professional talents to the winning of the war. Whereas professional military men who buck their president, whether it's Winfield Scott, the greatest American soldier uh, prior to the, the Civil War, or whether it's William S. Rosecrans or George McClellan or G.T. Beauregard or Joe Johnston or Douglas MacArthur or Admiral Fallon or General McChrystal, if they fight against their, their own presidents, they're gonna lose. And all the talents that they might have been able to apply will be nullified and negated. So it's not a matter of interference, it's a matter of rightful involvement and one of Grant's greatest strengths as the uniformed general in chief is that he knew how to work with the constitutional commander in chief. And that was an ability that he shared with Robert E. Lee uh, on the Southern side. So uh, we can go into detail about the Western front and I'd be happy to do that, but it's this broader thought that I really would like to leave with, with everyone here. And John, I thank you for bringing up such an important Consider. C c 
No, no, it would be the army, the army of the Cumberland under Rosecrans was very much criticized. The army of the Ohio under Buell was very much uh, criticized. Um, the army of the Gulf under Banks was very much criticized. What Western army was not very much criticized for the greater part of the war? The army of the Tennessee under Grant, because Grant understood how to work with the National Command Authority, as we would call it today, in, in Washington. And he, he earned the president's trust at each progressive level of responsibility to which he earned the right to uh, be promoted. And when he was promoted to general in chief, he retained that trust. And even when the shells are bursting over his head in Washington, he takes time to reply to a, pre to a message he's just received from President Lincoln, who has written that he's concerned that the Union victories in the Shenandoah Valley may cause the Confederates to uh, uh, flee the valley and concentrate against, uh, against Grant. And Grant's writing, well, I'm doing something right now to uh, take care of things uh, here. I understand, your, um, I understand your concerns, Mr. President. That certainly a true statement. I think we'd all probably agree that the Army of the Potomac got a little more love than some of the other armies did. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you three for such a wonderful presentation. If we can give them a round of applause very quickly.